Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here with you all. Um, I'm assuming it's Duke students and faculty, students and faculty from NC Central and NC a and and leadership from Durham Public Schools. If there are others, welcome. And I hope you are all doing your best to stay safe, to stay healthy, and encouraged during these unprecedented times. I don't think anybody would have thought that we would be in a world that was shut down, you know, the entire world, not just your city, not just the country, but the entire world. Um, but I wanna thank Jan Rigsby for inviting me and the FOCUS program uh, group and the, for making it possible for me to be here today to speak on the theme, as Jan said, building a legacy of leadership and service. Are you a stat or a story? Okay. So I just wanted to say with so many lives that have been lost over the past year, being intentional about building a living legacy is now more important than ever. Here are three notable individuals that we lost in addition to everyone. I mean, we've lost almost 200,000 individuals just in this country. First, former Glee actress, Naya Rivera, New York Mets legend, Tom Seaver, and superhero, Chadwick Boseman. And I want to start with an icebreaker based on this, what makes you want to holla and what brings you joy because of what we're dealing with with COVID. So in the chat, and I'm going to kind of uh, tell you what I would like you to do, what makes you want to holla? What's going on right now in the world, in your life, that makes you want to holla? Things that you are mad, get mad at, like COVID-19, cancer, Men that say they're gonna call and then don't. And then what brings you joy? Things like dancing, for me, I'm an over 60 fitness diva, good music, and the laughter of children. So I would love to hear some of the things that bring you joy and also what makes you wanna holler. Put that in the chat real quickly. I spend them at the same time like you. Hmm? And can, is it Kathy? Are you able to read them, read a couple of them to, for me? So you have to unmute okay. yourself. We have ignorance of COVID, uh, joy, my friends, my family brings me joy, my dog, I'm <laughs> joyful to meet new people, police shooting black men, um, joy family, holla, chronic illness, Global warming, joy socializing over food, joy rock and roll, joy my students, holla police violence, the California fires, joy learning, oh, it's going so fast. Uh, food brings me joy, holla COVID insensitivity, joy my focus classes, holla in ignorance and discrimination, sexism, racism, homophobia, Joy, my family painting, my dog, my boyfriend, animals, COVID-19, <laughs> ignorance in general, oh boy, um, performance activism, joy, getting acclimated to campus and meeting friends, my kids, meditation, holla, violence, ignorance, men, I'm going to assume that's holla, but I guess it could be joy, <laughs> um, isolation, joy, my friends, Friends, music, right. nature, cooking with roommates, um, hall of police brutality and systematic racism. Just a couple COVID, more. Yep. COVID-19, ignorance, racial issues, joys, meeting new people and living, making new friendships. When people come together to make the world better, hall of the California fires, joy, mentoring, my cat and friends, good food, nature, painting, friends, music, sleep. Sleep for sure, <laughs> hollas, COVID, racism, anti-blackness in schools, sexism, misogyny. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you, everybody, because that means that you're still around, you're still living, and that there is still joy, because it's so important that regardless of what's making you want to holla, and we know COVID-19 and just other things, you know, we heard about chronic illnesses, but there is joy. So I want to tell you a little bit about myself as I set this up for you around building a legacy of leadership and service. So who am I? I'm a speaker, 
That picture is when I was speaking in the Caribbean, been around the country and to South Africa, the Caribbean. And now I get to speak to audiences around the world because of Zoom and Facebook and other uh, platforms. I'm a social entrepreneur and activist. I'm the founder of Faraby Enterprises International, a global female empowerment social enterprise, where my activism is how I make money. So my for-profit, I do well, my for-profit, by doing good, serving others. The picture of me is in Durban, South Africa with a group of girls as part of a Step Africa. And some of you all may have heard of Step Africa. This was in 2009. All of the work that I do is to empower, educate, and inspire girls with a focus on girls of color. I'm also an author, as you've heard, author of Got It Going On, a personal development handbook series for girls of color. The first book that I wrote was for girls eight to 11. The second book for girls 12 to 17, Got It Going On, Two Power Tools for Girls which was a handbook that was the foundation of my award-winning Got It Going On Empowerment Program for Girls featured on Oprah and a winner of a 2003 Essence Award. The image of the book cover on the screen is the 20th anniversary edition of the second handbook in the series. I can't believe it was 20 years ago that I wrote this book and it'll be coming out in, later this month or early, later this year, excuse me, early uh, next uh, year. And by the way, you can order it on my uh, website and the I Am Enough uh, empowerment posters place in girls' study spaces. They're must-haves for girls' room. I'm a locally elected official. I'm an advisor neighborhood commissioner in what we call single member districts here in Washington, D.C. I'm responsible for um, representing the needs of about 2,000 individuals along with community, businesses, and uh, schools in my single member district. I'm the proud docent at the historic Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture with the privilege of interpreting the contents of the museum, sharing American history through the African American lens. And with me in that picture is Joan Trumpauer. Some of you may know her. She, is the, uh, she was an original freedom writer and the first Caucasian woman that was inducted into Delta Sigma Theta sorority, the second black sorority in the country. I'm also a stage 2B fallopian tube cancer survivor, blessed with 30 years of long-term recovery from drug and alcohol abuse on October 1st, the day after my 65th birthday this year. So why did I share all of these, as part, all of this, just this part of my life? This is my legacy of leadership and service, the building blocks of my story, the points in my life that were most relevant in preparing me to lead and to serve. As you will learn, legacy is something that you're creating every single day, whether you know it or not. Each and every one of you already has started building your legacy, and we'll talk about that in a moment. It's built upon the pieces of your life, positive or negative, because some of the negative issues and um, components of my life, I turned around into positive ways uh, and have become part of my positive legacy. <laughs> but today, your legacy will most likely include other areas um, as well. So why this information at this point? And that's the reason I wanted to do it up front. I wanted to give you an idea of who I am through my life experiences that are represented on the screen, as you see, the same way you've all had experiences and encounters that have made you the person that you are today, whether you're a student, an educator, faculty, or community member. Keep that concept in mind throughout the presentation. And I hope that you can see now how my experiences translated into the story that you read when you read my bio, which is what I now believe makes me a great storyteller, as Jan said, like at the museum. When it's appropriate, I interweave personal anecdotes within the history that I am sharing with the tours, like the story about Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman elected to Congress in 1968, and the first woman to run for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination, whose campaign slogan, anybody know it? I'm gonna give you two seconds to see if you know it. What was Shirley Chisholm's campaign slogan? Anybody, anybody? Unbought and unbossed. And she is one of the reasons that I decided to run for office. And I also believe that in knowing how to tell your story and how to tell my story, which was perfected in Alcoholics Anonymous of all places, 
has contributed to making me a great speaker, someone who's empowering and energizing my audiences with lived experiences, which are already, which you already have and will continue to collect with compassion. And I hope you all have lots of that with the community that you're going to be working with. And as one of the attendees at one of my workshops once said, she brilliantly mixes her street knowledge mm -hmm. with her wit to successfully empower, educate, and inspire. That's what's going to make you a great teacher, knowing the segments of your life and which ones to include, to weave together into a story that you can use to build your legacy of leadership and service. And you want to start thinking now about what have you already done in your life to lead and what have you already done in your life to serve, even at your young age. So who are you? Your peers may come to school and compete to get a title, get letters after their name, or good grades, and that's what I call a stat. And I'm sure that they'll be good teachers, but what will make you a great teacher is what we all want you to be, learning how to turn your personal life experiences, the things that you've gone through in your own life, again, learn how to choose relevant and appropriate ones for your audience, who could be your students, they could be the school, they could be the PTA, they could be the community, or they could be the press, into your story, the makings of a great teacher who will have a memorable impact on his or her students. And as Michelle Obama wrote, and you can see at the bottom, when you see yourself as more than a stat, more than that GPA, you begin to own the power of your story. That's what's going to set you apart. And Maya Angelou, many of you all know the poet who has passed away, gone on, um, gone on to glory, but she said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. But years from now, when your students are asked who was an influence in your life, they will say your name. That's when you know that you were or are a great teacher. Two of the teachers that influenced my life, I remember them very well. Miss Sporty, she happened to be my kindergarten and first grade teacher, and second grade teacher, excuse me. And then Miss Schoenfeld, who was my first and third grade teacher. We had a very special arrangement in Westbury, Long Island. So sometimes we have to see it in order to believe that we can be it. And what does a legacy of leadership and service look like? It looks like these three women. One of them might look familiar to you. It also looks like your instructors. It looks like your faculty. It looks like educators you see every day and soon it's going to look like you. So Dorothy Bolding Farabee, my great aunt, was a pioneering black female physician she graduated from Sim Simmons College, a private woman-focused woman women, women undergraduate university, class of 1920, 100 years ago. Tufts University Medical School ranked one of the world's best medical research institutions for clinical medicine, class of 1924. She graduated at the top of her class and accepted into residencies around the country, but once they saw her picture and realized that she was black, even though she was very fair, they wouldn't let her in, but she didn't let that discourage her. She ended up coming to Washington, D.C., to Friedman's Hospital, and worked at Howard University, served as faculty for over four, almost 40 years. She also ran an OBGYN private clinic in uh, D.C. and New York. She was also the second national president of the National Council of Negro Women, fourth national president of the Girl Scouts of the USA, first black woman, um, 10th International President of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the first black sorority in the country and appointed by both Presidents Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson to lead several international delegations, one in Germany, one in Africa, focusing on women and children and a civil rights and social justice activist. My mom, and you'll see why all of this makes sense in a moment, because think about who in your life you might be walking in their footsteps taking on and carrying on their legacy. The next figure is my mother, Elizabeth Grant Ferriby, who graduated from Virginia State University, uh, HBCU, one of the historically black colleges and universities in the US in 1946, and received her master's in education from Hofstra University, Long Island. 
New York's largest private university in 1966 while raising a family. He was an educator and administrator whose expertise was in special education. That's why this particular workshop is, and this presentation is really um, close to my heart. Uh, she was a community activist, PTA president, and active member of VISTA, which was founded in 1965 as a domestic arm of the Peace Corps. She was also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Then there's me. You already know a bunch of stuff about me, but what you might not know is that I started out at Johns Hopkins University as a pre-med major, partly due to the legacy of my aunt. I knew I could be a doctor because I saw her. I then transferred to and graduated from Michigan State University, part of the Big Ten in 1977, became the first African-American models editor for Seventeen Magazine over 40 years ago, and after 20 years out of undergrad, I went back to get my Master of Social Work from the University of Pennsylvania and Ivy League University in 1998, where I started, got it going on, but it was then known as Fitness and Fashion with Funk. I, too, am a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. So what do these three women have in common? Females of African descent, college-educated women, and the reason that I listed all those different um, varieties of colleges is because there are varieties of colleges that you all are attending, that your young people, the children that you'll be working with will be attending. So it's important to know about HBCUs, about women's schools, about um, Ivy League, uh, about schools like Duke, like NC Central, like NCANT. And it's important to let your young people know that you are going to be leading them and you're going to be showing them that it is possible. We're all members of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. We're all leaders in our community or were leaders, dedicated our lives to service. This is my Farabee family legacy. My legacy is one of leadership and service. So if you go back to what I said earlier and keep in mind for an exercise, another exercise that's coming up that, um, that I want you to end up working on, the lives of the Farabee women, excuse me, or that, that most, we picked most relevant, the things that were most relevant to leadership and service and have been woven together into the benefit our particular audiences, becoming our bios and our stories. Our audiences can relate to us because the pieces of our lives chosen to highlight and share, such as my cancer survival or my recovery, resonate with them. And some might even want to do what we do and believe they can because they see it. Someone who looks like them, but remember, sometimes we have to see it to believe that we can be it. Or if you don't look like your audience, because some of you may be working in communities where the students don't look like you, you now have to determine what will resonate with, the, with them so that they can relate to you. And here are some areas that, I've read that have resonated with the audiences of the women that I feature. For my aunt, it was her passion, the passion with, with which she served her patients and the strength as a leader of several national organizations. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. My mother, it was how she advocated for her students and empowered her faculty and how she was a loyal leader in the Westbury community where I grew up. For me, it was not only the compassionate and non-judgmental way I serve women and children, and especially girls, but advocating for my constituents as an elected official. The same will happen for you. Now, legacy, sorry about that. Now that you have some background, let's put it into context. What is legacy? Because we're talking about building a legacy of leadership and service. And how are you going to build a legacy of leadership and service? Legacy is about life and living. It's about learning from the past. Those experiences growing up, they could be painful. They may be filled with joy, but you will decide which ones to put into the story that you tell. Living in the present, what are you going to be doing right now? Many of you are going to be teaching. Many of you are teachers in training, some of you first year students, but what are you doing right now in the present? And then building for the future, how do you want to be remembered? Research shows that without a sense of working to create a legacy, adults lose meaning in their life. Have you ever thought about the legacy you're leaving your family, community, your world? 
most people never get it, give it a second thought. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, a legacy is something that you create every day, whether you know it or not, and it can be positive or negative. How does this apply to your life? And how do you create and tell your own story? And how do you use your voice and your story to lead and to serve? First, you need to develop a good grasp of what leadership is and what service is, and then how both of them relate to teaching. So what is leadership? The ability to direct myself and influence those around me, role model expected behaviors, and leverage strengths so that everyone feels fulfilled and valued. I really like this definition of leadership because it relates so well to you as teachers in training. The children you will be working with, most who will be eager to learn from you, do what you do, gonna be looking at you for acceptance, for guidance, for hope, and for leadership. And if you are, if you know anything about children, our children do 90% of what we do and 10% of what we say. So it's essential to be a positive power of example, not a bad example. And um, don't let me get on my soapbox, but I have a mantra called counteracting crazy. There is so much out there that influences negatively our young people, the negative influences, messages, um, especially with social media, some of the uh, entertainers, some of the actors and actresses. So it's important for you as the teacher that's going to be in the classroom with them, whether it's virtually or in person, to be a positive power of example. And this wonderful quote by John Lewis, who we also lost this past year, ours is not the struggle of one day, one week, or one year, ours is the struggle of a lifetime, or maybe even many lifetimes. And each one of us in every generation must do our part, Congressman John Lewis. This is your opportunity to do your part. Become more than a stat, more than your GPA, more than the letters behind your name. Start putting together the pieces of your leadership legacy. Since we're focusing on education, uh, or educating children, excuse me, but I, where children are concerned, there are two things that I know for sure. One is that children are one of the world's most precious natural treasures. And two, a nation's wealth is measured by the well-being of its children. During these unprecedented times, I believe our country, supposedly the richest country on the planet, is on the verge of human bankruptcy. With the U.S. and our world in turmoil, a pandemic responsible for thousands of deaths, rising unemployment rates, social distancing, and students forced to learn from home, hate, fear, and lack of humanity running rampant, and protests against systemic racism and police brutality raging across the country. And we heard some of those in the What Makes You Want to Holla, um, on the What Makes You Want to Holla list. Now more than ever, our children, our precious children, the next generation of teachers, scientists, public servants, artists, leaders, medical professionals, and caregivers need powerful, positive examples of leadership and service like you to model what is possible for them and to help them imagine a world beyond the global coronavirus pandemic. It is so important for you teachers in training and first year teachers and all of those of us who work with young people to model what is possible, to visualize, to talk about life beyond coronavirus, because we know um, that our young people are dealing with anxiety, dealing with a lot of ups and downs because of what's going on right now. So it's up to folks like me and the seasoned educators and faculty who are on this call, who have been in the field, to pass along our wisdom, our strengths, and our hope, and for you, the courageous and committed teachers, and I say courageous because those of us who have worked with young people know you gotta have a lot of courage and a lot of heart, but you have to love them. All of us to do the best to leave the world a little better for the children that are coming along after us. So in order to do that, you must draw on leadership skills that you already have and continue to develop them. Develop them first within your cohorts and then in your classrooms and in your community. And at a time when all children need to know that they matter, cultural competence is especially critical when working with communities of color, 
working with children of color. That's how you learn to serve. So what is service? Service is the action of helping or doing something for someone. Helping the children you will be engaging with to thrive through these challenging times in a non-judgmental way with cultural competence will set you apart from those who are just trying to get by or trying to get out the stats. You can do that by, helping, by heeding the words of these three individuals on the screen who have served or are serving the world in special ways. Dr. Martin Luther King's favorite, famous quote, I'm sure some of you all have heard it already, everybody can be great. Why? Because anybody can serve. And it's so appropriate for all of you who, are, who will be serving in such a humble um, profession. Sujitha Selvaraja, a 27-year-old doctor at the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, who is passionate about acknowledging her privilege and remaining receptive to new ideas while enacting meaningful change, is pictured here with her medical team. She's the in the bottom row kneeling, first on the left, appealing to the public to stay home and practice social distancing to protect others during COVID-19. And there are signs, you may not be able to see it, is to stay home and save lives. Says, protect the others and save lives. I always tell my audiences, never apologize, because she talks about acknowledging her privilege. Never apologize for where you come from, how much money you make or your parents have made, or the color of your skin. It's what and how you live that matters the most. And Chaswick Roseman, who we just recently lost, shared these inspiring words in his 2018 Howard University, just two years ago, commencement speech. Use your education to improve the world you are entering. He was the first black movie superhero who lived a legacy larger than life while he was right here on earth with us. That's what I want to do as well. That's what I want for you to do as well. Live your legacy today. Live it each and every day. Chadwood's portrayal of Jackie Robinson, James Brown, and Thurgood Marshall, three iconic African-American figures, and then Black Panther, allowed his actions to become legendary while he was alive. It's as if the gods knew that he was not long for this earth. So you might be saying, what have I done? I'm only 18, 19, 20. But in your young lives, I'm just talking about taking what you've lived and probably learn from, take that and think about the things that you might, that might resonate with your students, your teaching community, and shape it into a way to reach and support those students. So let's talk about how to do this, because that's what I want you to leave here. So creating, create and tell your own story. You're, you're already doing it. And that's what this is, we're talking about, building a legacy of leadership and service, how to take your story. So how do you do that? How to create your own story? And then how do you tell it? Most of you have done it already, and you may not even know it. When you apply to Duke or NC Central or NCAT a and or any of the other schools that might be on this call, you had to write an essay about yourself, and you should and why you should be admitted. That is the beginning of your own story and your own legacy. You, like me, might even be following in the footsteps of a relative or the footsteps of someone that you admire, carrying on that legacy. So you've started the legacy, you've started the process already. And if you had to write a special piece to get into the education program, you've already begun the process already had to talk about what is something, um, what is unique about yourself. And I'm pretty sure many of you wrote something about leadership and something about service. So the exercise that I have for you right now, and I want you to put it in the chat, tell me some of the things for the first year and for the students that are on the call, write in there some of the things that you wrote about in your essay that made you special, that make you unique. So when I see a few of them, or Kathy, let me know what folks are writing in there. But again, the exercise for you is to put some of those things that you wrote about in those essays. 
And if you didn't write an essay, you sure should have. Part of your assignment is going to be to write one when you get off this call. But again, I'm sure many of you all, if not all, had to write. I remember writing all my essays and figuring out how I could stand out. What made me special? What made me unique? What was I doing in my community? Anything yet, Kathy? Um, we've got a couple of things. Um, I'm taking over for Kathy for this one. Um, so oh, okay, who's, who's that? Abigail. Hi, Abigail, okay. <laughs> Um, so, um, someone wrote about drinking bubble tea without tapioca, <laughs> um, empowering people to contribute to a robotics team, mm -hmm. uh, loving writing music, being a metalhead, being part of the LGBTQ plus identity, um, okay. serving in the community, intellectual curiosity and finding relationships, um, how I utilize the concept of infinity to cope with my life. Um, being from a very small town in Southern Ohio, mm -hmm. um, a plant I got in third grade named Hop. <laughs> Hope. That makes more sense. Named Hope. Uh, uh, an identity, uh, food allergies, um, positivity, I think I mentioned, um, okay. being an expat, uh, living vicariously through Barbie. <laughs> through Barbie. Okay. Well, here's a, 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 Little known fact about Barbie, because as the model editor of Seventeen magazine, only 4% of the world's individuals are built like a supermodel. 96% of us are not. So I always used to tell the girls that would come for their go sees on Fridays, unless you have a whole lot of money, learn to accept who you are, whatever shape, size, or color. Thanks so much, Abigail. You can also use this exercise with your students. Have them draw a picture, especially if you're working with little ones. Have them draw a picture of what makes them unique or what makes them special, perhaps while looking in the mirror. Maybe even turning the exercise into an affirmation. And one of my favorite affirmations, which so happens to be about a mirror, is mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the greatest of them all? My, oh my, it must be me because I'm the only one I see. It affirms how special I am and used with children. It can help affirm how special they are and how great they are. But now it's a matter of refining your narrative, taking the pieces of your life that you wrote about, and you might even have some more things to add because you've just started school, you've made some new friends, you've had some new experiences, and you'll put them together depending on the different audiences that you will be addressing and what you are trying to accomplish. So for me, recovery and cancer survivor, I might be talking to a different audience, an audience of recovering addicts, alcoholics, or health professionals versus as an elected official, my story, I'll talk about leadership and le my leadership legacy and the fact that I am an ANC. I travel. Those are the different audiences. So the things that you are, have been doing, even again in your young lives, can be used to string together into your story. So how to serve using your own story. And again, what is service? Service is the action of helping or doing something for others. So I'm gonna repeat myself from earlier, helping the children you will be engaging with to thrive through these challenging times in a non-judgmental way with cultural competence will absolutely set you apart from those who are just trying to get by or get out. You can take that essay, and again, if you haven't written one, please do so as soon as you get off of this call. And turn that essay into your introduction, how you present yourself to your audiences. First, again, test it out with your cohort, and then with your students, or maybe on parent-teacher night. It's how you introduce yourself, and so on and so forth. Doing it with each other first. They can, your cohorts and your instructors can help you decide on the pieces that you want to go into your story, to go into that introduction or your presentation. You'll be able to serve your students better by using your own story, not somebody else's, but using your own story as your introduction. When you stand up in front of the class and you may be asking me, well, what are you talking about? The first day that you come to class, you have to talk about who you are using your essay, figuring out about the community, the young people that you're gonna be working with, what do you think will resonate with them? What is it, that, what are your goals? What are your dreams? 
Those are the things you wanna talk about with them. This is how they will get to know you, how you will begin to connect with them, and how you will be able to find out about their needs because they may, because, because they have been able to relate to you on some level. So these are also the ingredients to advocate for your student, which we'll get to momentarily. And again, because humanity transcends race and color, it doesn't matter if you come from a totally different background or environment than they do. What's important is that you are authentic. Children and youth can spot a fake in a minute and can, and can spot a fake a mile away. So don't try to be something you're not. Be who you are. They don't need you around them if you're not gonna be for real. That's a whole nother workshop. So that's how you can begin to serve using your story. So how do you lead using your own story? And this is the Little Rock Nine, the civil rights pioneers desegregating a high school in Arkansas in 1957. The definition of leadership, again, the ability to direct myself and influence those around me, role model expected behaviors, and leverage strengths so everyone feels fulfilled in values, in value, excuse me. Like servicing using your own story, leading is just a matter of taking the essay. Once again, I'm going back to that essay, which is now your story or introduction and use it to lead by example. In the classroom, on the school, in the schoolyard, um, at the bus stop. Whoever you told the students that you were when you, in your introduction, your story, you need to be that. You need to show up as that person each and every day. Your children remember who you said you were. Remember your students are gonna be looking to you for guidance and leadership, and they're gonna do what you do. If you told them that you were committed to being with students, you were committed to young people, and that being on time and being prepared was part of who you are, then guess what? You better be that. You need to be on time, <laughs> you need to be prepared. You are leading by example, because what do you think is gonna happen? And I know you, you know the answer to this. If you said, oh, I'm committed to young people, I'm gonna be on time, I want you all to be on time and be prepared, and then you consistently come in late, you're never prepared with your, um, you know, with your class work, you know, first of all, they're gonna tell you about it, right? They're gonna say, okay, I thought you said, that's what you told us who you are, part of your story, you said that you were committed to us, that you were prepared, you're going to be on time. They look at that. They listen to that because they're modeling. And at, especially at young ages, they want to do what you do. They want to be you. You also can lead by leveraging your strengths. And I'm sure that's also part of what you wrote about in your essay. If not, it sure should have been. That's what I wrote about. Every strength that I had, I could think of. And we heard some of them, apples on the so those strengths, which are most likely part of what makes you unique, now become part of your story. You don't necessarily have to speak about them, just be about them. Again, they will see those things and want to be those things. You'll be learning to lead with your story. And to tie service and leadership together, just remember that service is an integral part of leadership. And finally, how to advocate using your story. So advocacy is supporting and promoting the interests of, of others. If you are fighting for a cause or trying to make a case for your students and or their families, and eventually you might, your story or even creating and using their stories with integrity and respect and confidentiality, just you know, knowing what things to use about their stories, about them as well, could help others relate. If you have the opportunity to address the school, staff, the PTA, the school board, the community, the city council, or the mayor, or even the press, you'll be prepared with your story and or the students, which now becomes a vehicle to help you lead and serve. Just like this group on the screen of charter school advocates who showed up at the 2018 California Democratic Convention to show support for quality education for all children. So to sum it up, taking the experiences of your life turning them into the essay, the essay that you've already written, already should have written, turning that into your story, which now becomes the start to introduce yourself to this community and to the world. It will soon become second nature. 
I hope you will take beneficial bits and pieces of this presentation and turn them into a blueprint for creating your own story and start to build your own legacy of leadership and service. As you begin for some of you and continue for others, your journey to becoming a great teacher and serving our children with compassion, with creativity, with humor, integrity, and pride. And before we go, I want to read one of my favorite poems by Linda Ellis. It's called The Dash, emphasizing the importance of embracing each and every day of your life. It's a powerful reminder to do that, why we need to live each and every day with humility and purpose. And then I have an assignment for you, one more assignment to leave with everyone. The Dash. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on her tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of her birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. So that dash represents all the time that they spent alive on earth. And now only those who loved her know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the home, the cash. What matters is how we live in love and how we spend our day. Think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that still can be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the, other, the way that other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash, dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogies being read, when your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your day? Mm, think about that. So in the final time I have, I want to challenge you. How are you going to live your dash? Whether you are a student, a teacher, faculty, administrator, community member, this is for you to take home. How are you going to live your dash? A lot of people don't like to think about the death date, but it's coming. So the dash is really important. Take stock of last year, set goals for the coming year. We talked about building a legacy of leadership and service, but that's only part of who you are. You can do this exercise only around leadership and service, or you can do it with around other parts of your life that are or will be important to you. For example, philanthropy might become something important to you. You might wanna be the next Oprah or Warren Buffett and give away some money. I do this every year on New Year's Day, updating my life's plan in honor of my mother who died on New Year's Day, 2003. She wanted me to live my life, my life out loud and I hope she's proud of me because I'm doing the best that I can to stay as healthy as I can for as long as I can and to remain happy, healthy and whole. Here's another reading, how to create your living legacy by Sharon Lecter, the takeaway. We all come into this world with the ability to create impact. Whatever you want your impact to be, why wait until you have left this world for it to be realized? You can create your living legacy by taking action and opening up for the world to benefit from you and your contribution. When we all are living our legacy, then we will truly see maximum benefit. Here's my final reading. And I love those guys at the bottom. <laughs> Remember, it's not what you leave for others that matters. It's what we leave in them that matters most. Possessions and wealth do not a true legacy make. It's about leaving behind the essence of your authentic soul. That's what the world needs from you. So serve others by leaving behind the best and most beautiful parts of you. The day and every day, create your legacy. Just like the minions are doing down at the bottom, they have a legacy. And if you don't know about it, you need to find out about it. They are the best things since sliced bread. <laughs>
So I want to thank you so much for your time and attention today. And it's been my absolute pleasure, Jan, to speak to all of you this evening. And I hope this has been beneficial, especially for the first year students. I'm more than happy to entertain any questions at this time before we close. So I am going to... If anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hand on Zoom and I will call on you um, or type it in the chat, I guess, if you don't want to <laughs> speak in front of everyone. <laughs> Start to tell your own story um, without sounding like you're bragging and uh, truly just tell. Can you speak, can you speak up for me, please? I was just wanting to know um, how you tell your story mm -hmm. without um, sounding like you're bragging about yourself um, and tell it humbly, but still come across with your strengths. Well, if what I would say is the things that I said, you know, because that first, um, group of pictures of me, some people will say, well, dang, you know, she's just talking all about herself. But you have to get comfortable knowing who you are. So get comfortable knowing the things that you're proud of. So it turns from bragging into confident sharing about who you are. And then take a look at how those strengths or the things that you're proud of yourself, how you think they might be able to help someone. That's where the humility comes in. When I talk about being um, in recovery, being a cancer survivor, it's humility because, it, you know, letting somebody know that I've been through that, but they can also figure out what they might be able to get from that. When I talk about I've been, you know, I'm an AKA or I've been to the University of Pennsylvania, it's not so much just that I've been to an Ivy League school, it's because I had some goals and, and, and um, dreams and I made them come true. So for you, it's the, the humility comes in how you say it. So learn to become comfortable with the things that you love about yourself and it, it will start rolling off. It'll become second nature. But that, yes, there is a difference between conceit and confidence. And that's where humility comes in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't think we do it enough. And I'm just going to say that a lot of people do not want to share about themselves because they think that they are boasting or bragging. Learn how to confidently share about yourself. Um, we have a question from the chat. Okay. Um, how do you avoid getting caught up in the day-to-day -day pressures and keep track of your life goals slash purpose in life? Part of the way I do it, as I mentioned to you, every New Year's Day, I write down you know, what transpired the year before and what my plans are for the coming year. I've already planned out um, what I would like to accomplish by the time I'm 95, um, because my dad passed away at 96, and so I figure and I'll be 65 at the end of this month. I have about 30 good years left. So write them down, write them down so that you can go back to them because life is gonna happen. Absolutely, so great question. Life is gonna happen, but write them down and write them down in increments of what works for you. It could be, um, if you're trying to you know, lose weight, it could be increments of week by week. If you want to go to school, you know, it could be increments of what the deadline is for an application. If you want to get a certain type of degree, you know, know what you need to do over the next four years. Um, but writing it down will help you and put it somewhere where you can see it. Don't hide it. I have things on my refrigerator, I have pictures, I have a vision board, and that may be what you want to create, creating a vision board. And I change that every so often, but it doesn't change that much because body, book, business, those are the three main things that are on my vision board. Putting that on your vision board is gonna be very helpful. But writing it down, putting it in front of you um, will be very helpful. Another question from the chat. Um, Henry was wondering, how often do you find yourself reflecting on your own story slash legacy or how you are carrying someone else's legacy? Are there ever times when you set aside everything else in the moment to think about it? How often do they come? 
Well, when the museum was open, um, it used to be a couple times a week because I would share, as I mentioned, I would share about my legacy, my story, you know, interweaving uh, with the history that I was sharing. But now, um, because I'm writing a book and because I do speak, it's a couple times a week. And as a teacher, as someone who is probably going to be working with young people, thinking about it on a daily basis um, is a good idea because you never know when you're going to be called upon to share your story, to tell your story, or to lead by example. Take a couple more we've got, and then I'm going to close. If anyone else? I actually have a question for you. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Related to the past one, how do you feel, um, how do you get away from the weight of your family's legacy while mm -hmm. still honoring it? Ooh, great question. Part of it is because I believe it's my calling. Because I believe it's my calling, there's not a great burden. I have carved out my own road, you know, unlike my great aunt who's, I mean, did a million things. I still don't know how she ended up doing them all. I look to her for, uh, for guidance. And, you know, as an ancestor, I look to how she kind of structured her life, but I try to not think about having to be them, but doing it in my own way. So there are a lot of folks probably on the call who either come from families that have a legacy of something, a legacy of teaching, a legacy of business owning, you know, owning businesses, a legacy of something. And sometimes they feel the, the weight of that I have to do such and such. It's also about, again, figuring out what your calling is and then going for it. Because if your calling is outside of what your, leg you know, your family's legacy is, it's important to be able to stand on your own and be, um, be your own person so that you don't carry the weight of your legacy. So we have a few more minutes. I am going to move on and then let Jan take it back. Is that good, Jan? Yes. So again, here's my contact information. Please do not hesitate to be in touch, as I mentioned at the beginning. My book, Got It Going On, uh, the 20th Anniversary Edition, Personal Development Handbook for Girls, and the I Am Enough Empowerment Posters, hashtag Black Girls Matter, hashtag Latina Girls Matter, hashtag All Girls Matter, are available on my website. Again, I want to thank you and leave you with this. Please be kind to yourself and others and always remember to speak life to our children for they become what you tell them. Thank you so very much for your attention and thank you so very much, Jan, for letting me be part of this opportunity. Janice, before you leave, can I ask that we do something? Yes. Okay. Can you... Um, Stop sharing as soon as you get like everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I please ask everybody who is willing to please turn your cameras on? I want us to be able to, um, A, like everybody wave and say, undo, undo your thing and tell her thank you. She's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. So I'm doing a group shot right now, Thank you. and I want everybody to smile and do something with your hands and to Janice, okay? Big smiles. You too, David. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susie, for, for doing that. That was great. And Janice, are you fine with the questions that we were not able to get to if um, our colleagues would, can send those to you? That would be fine. Yep. Well, that, that is great. Well, I want to thank you um, for sharing your legacy and story. It's certainly an inspiration and I think a call to action um, to, to lead and serve using our own story and, and to understand ourselves, others, and our world through shared stories. And I think finally to live our dash.
I love that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Please be safe, everyone. Stay healthy and vote. Those of you who are of voting age, get out and vote. Janice, I hope someday you can come and visit us at Duke. Yes. I would love to. I would love, love to. Have. When the world opens up again. Absolutely. Yeah. It would be great to have you. Thank yes. you. Absolutely. It would be wonderful Thank you. to have you. And it's Thank good you to so put much. faces to names. Wonderful. Thank teaching years. Um, and I know that your students are very, very lucky. And let's stay connected, Janice. Absolutely.